Welcome to everyone to this inaugural session of the COVID-19 and Children's Seminar Series. My name is Roshni Matthew. I am a pediatric infectious disease clinician uh, with also experience with hospital epidemiology. Um, I co-chair this series with Dr. Alan Schroeder, who is a pediatric hospitalist as well as a pediatric intensivist. Um, the goal with this series is to share uh, trustworthy evidence-based information on COVID-19 in children in this very rapidly uh, changing knowledge base that we are having on a regular basis. We will have weekly sessions on topics that are cover a broad range of COVID-19 um, in pediatrics. Uh, today's session will basically touch uh, on various aspects, but only briefly, and thereafter we will have weekly sessions that will elaborate on different topics. As you can see, the next session is on vaccines and the following session is about uh, opening of our schools. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to claim CME credit, please go ahead and test, uh, text the code to the telephone number uh, to confirm your attendance. Next slide, please. Alan and I are very grateful to a very robust committee that we have. Uh, we have a distinguished uh, uh, expertise on this panel. As you can see, we wanted to make sure that all areas of COVID-19 are covered through our se seminar series. We are also very grateful to Alison Guerin and Ingrid Garnica, who are basically the hands behind the scene that make sure everything comes out beautifully. Um, now, moving on to the session for today, we have, we have a very distinguished panel today who are truly the titans of pediatric infectious disease, um, and their accomplishments are too long to list, so my introductions of them will be very brief. I personally, I am so honored to have been able to train under each of them as a fellow in pediatric infectious disease, and today it's my honor to uh, welcome each of them. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado is a professor of pediatrics and professor of health research and policy and serves as the senior associate dean for faculty development and diversity at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is the chief of division of pediatric infectious disease since 2008. She is also the chair of the Red Book Committee, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases. Dr. Maldonado's um, research in activities have been very widespread in different viral infections, and currently she's a pioneer uh, in COVID-19 research in terms of its prevalence, transmission in therapeutic trials, as well as vaccine trials. Next, Dr. Philip Pizzo is the David and Susan Heckerman Professor and Founding Director of the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. Dr. Piso served as the Dean of Stanford School of Medicine from April 2001 to December 2012. Uh, Dr. Piso is also double boarded in addition to pediatric infectious diseases in pediatric hematology and oncology and has been involved in landmark studies in the management of childhood cancers as it intersects with infectious disease as well as the management of HIV AIDS. Next, Dr. Charles Prober is the founding executive director of the Stanford Center for Health Education and senior associate vice provost for health education at Stanford University. He has served as associate chair for education for the Department of Pediatrics and senior associate dean for medical education at the School of Medicine for 10 years for two, from 2007 to 2017. Dr. Prober has extensively published in viral infections again uh, with CMV and hepatitis, uh, sorry, herpes simplex virus infections, as well as has expert, extensive expertise in osteomyelitis and meningitis. Um, this is just a brief introduction of these individuals. I will turn it over to Alan to st start the conversation. And towards the end, we'll have a few minutes to take questions from the audience as well. Thank you, Rajni. And, and just to echo uh, all of the accolades and appreciation to our panelists today, um, as, as Rajni mentioned, our intent uh, uh, is to really to provide a trusted source of up-to-date information uh, about the pandemic uh, and issues particularly relating to children. And, and uh, I can't think of three faculty members that, that uh, so many of us have grown to trust more in terms of their judgment and guidance. So, so thank you all. Uh, for the rest of the hour, um, we'll have a, a series of questions that are that are central to 
uh, childhood issues uh, surrounding the pandemic. I will serve uh, as moderator and, and hope that I have an easier time than, than Chris Wallace, uh, but um, I think you guys are a, a fairly uh, well-behaved and civil group. Um, we're gonna save about 10 minutes for the Q&A uh, towards the end, um, so please enter your questions. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna reserve the final five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna ask the panelists to reflect on some recent comments from uh, Dr. Tony Fauci uh, about lessons learned over the course of the pandemic. So let's get started. Uh, and, and I wanna begin by discussing uh, the coronavirus that we all knew pre-pandemic. And, and Dr. Maldonado, for, for most of us, um, we may have learned a bit about the virus during medical school. We may have, have read about uh, some of the outbreaks that had, that had occurred over the last decade or two, but, but our main clinical experience was that sometimes this virus would pop up on, on our viral testing uh, panels. Um, we'd say, you know, oh, phew, it's coronavirus, um, and, and that would kind of be it. But things are different now. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the virus and why this strain is, is so different? Yeah, so you're right. I think uh, most of us really pretty much ignored that virus when it was on the panel and some even wondered why it was there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are seven coronaviruses, human coronaviruses. There are many of them, but seven that infect humans naturally. Um, four of those are seasonal coronaviruses. And we know that those can be the cause of about 30% or so of uh, annual uh, cold um, colds uh, symptoms. Uh, what's different, though, is since 2002, we've seen three new emerging coronaviruses, and I think that should tell us something about what to think about for the future. I just got off an AAP webinar I was hosting around the G4 pig flu virus, which just in case we didn't have enough to worry about, we have to start thinking about not only avian but pig viruses. It really does uh, emphasize the fact that these many of the viruses we see, including coronaviruses, are zoonoses and that we have to be very careful about um, you know taking any of these uh, non or mildly pathogenic viruses for granted so uh, it, so those coronaviruses circulated um, but there are others in animals that don't affect us in fact there are millions of viruses in the world uh, that exist in um, in animals and plants and uh, don't affect us or don't cause disease in us as far as we know um, that we just need to be aware of and really has, this has implications on how we look at environmental and climate issues um, as, as well as global population shifts, migrations, and overpopulation. So these things all impact us. When I teach my epidemiology class, I usually give a triangle around what are the factors that affect infections in people, and they are the host, the pathogen and the environment. And all of those interplay all the time to dictate whether we think something is a pathogen or, and whether it will become a pathogen. Well, thank you. And, and there's been, um, I think, a lot of discussion about the extent to which we, we should have uh, seen this, this pandemic coming. Um, and Ingrid, if you can maybe just uh, share uh, the slide real quick with us. Um, this next question is for Dr. Prober, uh, and, and you did see it coming. Um, uh, oh, yeah, just a minute, Alan, I gotta put on my, my mask if I'm gonna talk. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't hear you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, this, is, this is Dr. Prober's 2018 textbook. Um, that is, in fact, the coronavirus on the cover of that book. What made you so prescient, Charles? How did, how did you decide to put this virus on the cover of your textbook. Well, thank you for that question, Alan, and also for pronouncing prescient, because I always get that part wrong. Uh, so I'd like to say that uh, we, the three editors, uh, Sarah Long and uh, Mark Fisher and myself, realized that this was coming along, and, and that's why we chose this cover. Boy, uh, so the truth. The truth is, it actually is a very attractive virus when you look at it under electron microscopy, and especially if you color it pink. Um, and we were looking for a cover that actually was quite distinctive, because of course we wanted to sell the book. Uh, so I don't know if it was as prescient as, as we would have liked to claim. In fact, when I pointed this out to Sarah, like literally four days ago, she said, oh my God, I didn't know that was on the cover. Uh, so we, we won't take a lot of credit. As, as one of our, of our mentors, uh, Phil's, Bonnie, and mine, uh, Jack Remington would say, even a blind squirrel can find nuts. 
Um, <laughs> just to assure you that um, we all get things wrong from time to time. I submitted an op-ed uh, to uh, the New York Times, which I do often. You might have never seen them in press because they haven't been. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I submitted it, I got wonderful feedback by Nick Kristoff, who read it on, on my behalf and tried to lobby for it. It's fortunate that it wasn't published. It was in March. And I predicted uh, and gave 10 reasons why this coronavirus would not be a problem and would go away within two or three months. I won't iterate those here, uh, but clearly I was wrong. Um, and as we've watched the pandemic evolve, um, we all have learned uh, from, the, from the very top of the NIH to everybody else that we will get things wrong because it's a novel virus. And novel means we haven't seen it before and it means we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. In the interim, we have learned a tremendous amount, thanks to people like Bonnie, who is really doing an outstanding job on behalf of the infectious disease community and certainly on behalf of Stanford, and I would applaud her. And just before I stop talking, I would like to thank both Rashi and you, Alan, for putting this course together. I am equally honored to participate with my colleagues, Bonnie and Phil. Well, well thank you, Charles, uh, and, and for your modesty especially. Um, uh, I'm going to move to you, Dr. Pizzo. This is not your first epidemic, and, and I know that you uh, will be uh, speaking about kind of the history of, of a century's worth of pandemics at our Grand Round uh, later this month. But um, what's, what has surprised you thus far? Um, should, should we uh, have learned more from SARS and MERS and, and other pandemics? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to just add my thanks as well, Alan and Raj. And this is a great service. And I was going to also compliment Bonnie, who's just been an incredible resource and spokesperson for Stanford and way beyond. So thank you for that. And Charles, I didn't know, given all that you uh, were writing in your op-ed piece, that you were also advising the White House, because it sounds like a policy that they've adopted. Um, but that's a story for another, another time. So back to your um, question. You know, we should learn from history. And I think the way you asked the question makes me uh, wonder whether I was right there during the 1918 uh, epidemic. <laughs> Not quite that old. But, um, you know, there were many lessons that took place then that are still highly relevant to today. And I'll just advance forecasts. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that on October 30th when I do do pediatric grand rounds. But let's just fast forward um, to where we are today. As Bonnie articulated, you know, we've known about the um, coronaviruses that cause cyclical upper and lower respiratory infections. They're about 10 to 15 percent of the infections that occur uh, in the respiratory tract. And we knew about SARS um, in 2002 when the first SARS came on the scene. And, um, you know, that caused a lot of fear and a lot of challenge. And yet um, it dissipated very quickly. Uh, because um, we were able to then kind of control it. And what's been mysterious about it is that that virus has literally just disappeared. Whether it mutated its way out of existence or not is unclear, but it was a kind of warning and we responded to it. And I think one of the things about that is that a couple of countries who experienced more deaths with SARS-1 um, than any other, Taiwan and China, connected to each other by about an 80 mile uh, distance, um, you know, really responded to this virus with lessons learned then that have controlled it, it's certainly in Taiwan more than almost any place else. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other virus, the other um, uh, coronavirus of note is MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, which kind of came on the scene in 2012. And that, too, is a little bit enigmatic, isn't it? Because we've not seen that virus become pandemic. And, you know, one of the questions is, why is it circulating? You know, it's got its host in camels. Why is it not moving beyond the borders? Um, this particular coronavirus is uh, defying all the odds, right? I mean, we are witnessing now already um, a literally significant amount of fatalities. As you know, this week we crossed 33 million cases in the world. Um, there are now over a million deaths, 200,000 of which are here in the United States, the highest of any uh, nation. And we're on, we haven't even gotten to the second wave, you know, potentially if that occurs where um, this could begin to get very close to what we saw in 1918, where after three cycles, um, you know, three waves, 
it led to 675,000 deaths. So this is a pretty daunting time. And uh, we need to be much more engaged, I think, as a nation than we have been. And I know we're going to come to that uh, during our conversation. But we will. Um, and thank you for that context. And, and, and let's move uh, to talk a little bit about children um, and what we know clinically in children. Uh, when when uh, this first started surfacing in, in Wuhan and, and, and then Iran and in and, and some of the European countries, Northern Italy particularly, um, the, the narrative was really that children weren't impacted. Um, and that has changed a little bit. Uh, Dr. Prober, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to talk a, a, about what we know about uh, infections in kids thus far and, and why the increasing reports uh, in childhood cases in the US now. Thank you, Alan. Well, just, uh, and, and Bonnie, I hope we'll chime in here as well, or Roshni as well, and Phil. Um, as of last week, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics data gathering, there were about 625,000 cases in children. So it's, of course, not that children do not get infected. That 625,000 is quite a big number. Now, it is only about 10% of all of the cases of coronavirus in the country, but it's, uh, again, not an inconsequential number. In terms of hospitalizations, we all recognize that the frequency of hospitalizations for children compared to adults is substantially different. Uh, again, AAP numbers, the rate of hospitalization in children is somewhere between 0.5 and 3.7% of all cases. So a very small proportion compared to the truly at-risk groups, the elderly, those with underlying disorders and so forth. Um, and in terms of COVID deaths, uh, if you look from state to state, the percentage of COVID deaths among children who are infected ranges from zero uh, in 17 states as of last week to 0.26%. So again, very small numbers, but, uh, not, but existing numbers. We all recognize, because the first case was described from Packer, that children can, can, can have unusual manifestations uh, related to COVID, including an inflammatory disease that you all have heard about at this point. Um, it's becoming much more frequently diagnosed. The CDC data also from about a week ago or so in terms of counting the absolute number of children who have died in the under one year age group, 20, very small number, but 20. In the one to four age group, small number, 14. In the five to 14 year age group, 30. And then the numbers start going up. There are many theories about why children are less infected. Uh, it actually was one of my 10 reasons for being optimistic in my rejected op-ed that children at that time were not showing severe symptoms and morbidity and mortality. That remains true. So one out of 10, I guess, isn't bad. Uh, but the, the reasons really aren't clear. Larry Steinman recently published a paper on some of the immunologic features that may favor children as relates to this virus. Um, one of, for example, is the ACE receptors, which are low in the respiratory tract of children. The ACE receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, is important for the docking of the virus. And if you can't, if the virus can't dock, it can't cause much illness. And there are a number of other factors which are being entertained as why children are protected. And as Bonnie said in her first response, if you look at that triangle of the host, the environment, and the agent, Fortunately, the host in this instant, our population, children, uh, are, are less uh, affected, but they certainly are infected and result in the spread of the virus. That is clear. Well, maybe, since you, you mentioned Dr. Maldonado, uh, Bonnie, maybe you can talk, uh, expand on that a little bit. We've, we've seen some of the uh, ACE2 receptor expression data. Um, do you think um, that that explains some of it, most of it? What, what else is, is making it less morbid in kids? Well, I, I think there's gonna be a number of factors. It's not gonna be simple. Uh, as uh, Nothing with this virus has been simple. Um, but I, I think that uh, Betsy Harrell published a really nice paper last uh, two weeks ago around uh, innate immunity. And it appears that innate immunity um, in children uh, maybe more robust to, for coronavirus, um, which is interesting because that's generally hasn't always been the case for young children, but it appears for this virus to be the case. Um, that may have something to do with um, the whole pathway that the virus takes, as Charles mentioned. Um, so, uh, but the, so we don't we don't really know. It, it, there may be some immune 
uh, basis for that, some virologic and, and other factors. I, I would mention as well in relation to what uh, Charles said is that uh, children uh, um, can also transmit disease pretty easy, not easily, but can transmit to others. And we are doing a household transmission study here at Stanford. It's, uh, we've reached about 25 families so far. Um, and what's interesting is the transmission rate in households is about 30%, but only two children out of 13 have actually been infected so far. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, both of them, one of them was an index case and one was infected as a contact. But we've seen data from daycare centers that suggest that infants, that, that most children who are infected are not symptomatic or have mild symptoms. But even in, in that daycare study from the MMWR, there was a transmission from an eight month old to both of its parents. Now we don't know if that child was symptomatic or not. The article didn't say, but yeah. the point is that children are definitely infectious whether they have lower viral loads, it actually is the opposite. What the, the one paper we do have suggests that viral loads are very high rather than the other way around. Well, we're, we're gonna, we may come back to that a little bit because we're gonna talk about schools in a bit. And, and obviously transmission um, is, is pretty central to the, to the school reopening debate. But Dr. Pizzo, um, uh, uh, Dr. Prober talked about some of the numbers um, uh, in, in terms of cases and deaths in children. And you know, early on uh, for, you know, for beyond children, there was the narrative that, that this is just a bad flu. And I think all of the data in adults has, has, has sort of put that to rest. But um, can you compare what we've seen so far in kids to some of the other um, you know, either vaccine preventable or non-vaccine preventable conditions, uh, infections yeah. that we've yeah. seen in children in the U.S.? Yeah, I think first of all, we should all say we're pleased, of course, that children aren't getting severe disease with the infection. I think it's also true, and others, everyone is commenting on this, that our knowledge about this is continuing to evolve over time. So the judgments that we made at the beginning of this current pandemic are being modified today. I mean, now it's very clear as Bonnie and Charles articulated that children actually have high levels of virus in their anterior, in, in their nasal and respiratory tract. Um, so they can become vectors for transmission. Um, you know, what's also interesting is, is that um, there is variance um, with other diseases. So, you know, this, this disease is different from what we usually see. You know, there's usually the kind of U curve where children, young children and older people are more affected. That's particularly true with some uh, influenza variants. But then there is also um, the reality as was witnessed um, uh, very clearly with the, you know, the 1918 epidemic, there was a W shaped curve, which was that young adults, um, 18 to 40 had the worst outcomes. And that was because of some of the things we're seeing um, with SARS-CoV-2, a very significant immune response um, that leads to an inflammatory ARDS-like pattern, as well as direct destruction. And there are tie-ins that we're beginning to learn um, that contribute to some of those risk factors. Bonnie mentioned um, the innate immune system, and we now there's now evidence that, um, as we've seen for other infections, if you lack um, interferon receptors, that could potentially impact um, the course of disease in its own right. So there is going to be a phenotypic response that varies a lot um, with different diseases. We saw this, um, you know, with HIV disease uh, very clearly. When HIV disease came about, children had some of the same, quote, opportunistic infections, but they had very other um, significant disease manifestations, neurocognitive changes, growth um, changes, which were different from what you see in in older uh, adolescents or and adults. So we have to take a new framing each time we're around this to really understand the disease as pediatricians. But we have to, I think, first and foremost, look at this as an integrated environment. You know, the notion um, that we can age cohort and direct, you know, our strategy in an age cohorting way um, doesn't take into account that kids could get infected um, by adults or the children can carry the disease into homes and home communities. So there are no, there are no um, uh, boundaries around where this virus can go or has gone. 
And, and Dr. Maldonado, um, I, I know we emailed a little bit, and I think I, I've already seen a question um, pop up uh, about um, the the science paper published yesterday, and I, and I know we all haven't had a chance to really read that in full, but it it, it touched, and this is on the subject of transmission, and, and it sort of gets at the idea of um, you know, people that are the super spreaders or high transmitters, and there was a, a, a provocative article on this yesterday in the Atlantic as well, um, talking about uh, the dispersion factor. But, but how is it that so much of the transmission is happening from such a small proportion of people? I think in the, in the science study, 70% of people wound up not passing on the infection to anybody else, whereas 8% of the people passed it on to something like 60% uh, of, of the future cases. Yeah, so uh, that phenomena, I, I actually don't like the term super spreader because it doesn't really mean anything scientifically to me, but it does capture the concept that we don't, that we don't understand how viruses are transmitted. I've spent the last 20 plus years trying to figure out how polio gets from one person to another. And despite our best efforts, we still, we say fecal oral, but we don't really know what that means. So I just published a paper, well, a couple of years ago now, published a paper showing that people in a household of a polio vaccine are equally as likely to be infected by that virus as the person that lives on the other side of that community. How is that possible? So we don't really understand transmission and um, a f MRSA, for example, uh, you know, other, uh, many other viral diseases. So, and what I teach at a, a graduate class called Epidemiology of Infectious Disease, I've been teaching it with Julie Parsnett and Jason Andrews now for, well, for Julie for maybe 15 years or so. And more recently, we, Jason has brought to us like the young modelers who can really get in there and dig deep into the models, which is really exciting. And we were teaching modeling this quarter, last uh, Mar uh, winter quarter, um, and there are lots of concepts around how you build something called a dynamic transmission model. So not just the straight SEIR, so susceptible, infected, recovered. That's the basic R0 kind of approach. But I think what you saw in the article is very is what one of my colleagues in statistics is calls the flaw of averages, which is, you know, on average, you know, the the joke about the three people, the statistician and the surgeon, uh, and the statistician who, the surgeon, the pediatrician who, you know, one person shoots at a duck and, and hits it six, misses it by six feet on the left, the other hit, hit, misses it by six feet on the right, and the statistician says, you got them, because mm -hmm. you're right in the middle. So the point is, there's a distribution and that distribution is uh, really measured by something called K, and we've all now heard about K. We were teaching K. You don't want to see the formula. I don't understand the formula. It's grounded in science, but it's very complicated. And the problem with it, just like we said about any model, is that all models are wrong, but some are helpful. No one model will really work. Um, but they can give you some information, and they're based on the assumptions you make, like the assumptions that Charles made in writing his op-ed might have been right for all, you know, they could have been right. We just, you know, it, we just don't know which ones were right and which ones were wrong. And so um, the dispersion of, a, of an organism um, is very hard to figure out. We know now with our environmental engineers, they've been me measuring that dispersion, but even that doesn't tell you enough because how, what are you dispersing? Are you dispersing you know, highly uh, virulent virus, or what is the virulence factor that you need in that virus to get it moving around? So, uh, so it just tells us that um, two things. One is we don't know enough to really calculate that to see what a super spreading event is, but that we do know those occur. The second is that um, we know, despite the fact that we don't know enough, we know more about this virus than we know about almost any other agent. So. That just tells us how much more we need to understand about all of the pathogens around us and the need to, again, I'm gonna really focus on this because you know we will get through this, but we need to not forget about it and really come back and try to build models to understand how the world around us interacts with our own immune system. Yeah, um, Ellen, can I just um, chime in and ask a question to Bonnie just to continue that? 
dialogue, which is, can you comment, Mani, on whether the data regarding dispersion or the experimental data regarding aerosolization as compared to air droplets, how does that change in your mind the way we should be approaching the disease? Because there's a discordance um, with what the dispersion and the aerosolization data show and the epidemiological data in terms of risk. What, what does it mean to us practically? Yeah, so practically what it means is, uh, you know, that um, it, it appears, so here's, so here's what we do know, here's the piece that I think is critical. So it does seem that if you're crowding people together in unventilated areas, that's going to be a risk, but not all the time. Right. So what is that X factor that we don't understand? Who is that super spreader? And that's why I don't like that term, because right. I don't know if we have a phenotype Right. of what that person is because we have plenty of those events and we've seen pictures of people sitting in crowded bars and you don't see outbreaks there but then you have that church in seattle where right. you know 90 uh, percent of the people got sick three of them were hospitalized and one died so what were the characteristics of that that quote unquote super spreader event that other events that were very similar didn't have and one of the things about epidemiology is that we usually like to use outliers to help prove, you know, to find the variables. Because right. you're trying to look at the ends of the spectrum, they tell you something about what's going on in the middle that the noise masks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in terms of changing our current practice, yeah. it, I mean, the assumption that I make is it doesn't change it at all. We still know that yeah. you know, the data is three to six feet, six feet is more optimal. We right. know Masks make a difference and yeah. anti hygiene. So the dispersion Absolutely. is important scientifically, but doesn't immediately alter what we Well, should in do. fact, I think you're right, Phil. It probably reinforces that because we need to keep doing that and it works. It's working. So if in the hospital, for example, in our hospitals, we know that when you're doing the things that we recommend, that you're we're not seeing transmissions happen. That's right. So it has to be working. And when people say, well, it should be seven feet or it should be 10 feet, right. well, maybe, but it, if, it's, if that's the case, right. we haven't seen. And epidemiologically, you can always, if you found enough outliers that you couldn't find a source for, then you would start to worry. This happened, by the way, as you know, with HIV. When I was at CDC, my job was to go out and find those atypical cases. Yeah. Yeah. And when you went to talk to the people, they had risk factors. They just couldn't yeah. admit them to the public. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, and I think that to your points, the the um, the, the science article from yesterday, I, a lot of the super spreader events. Sorry for using that word, Bonnie, but um, uh, were linked to, to trains and buses. Um, so really, I think I, at least I'm quite confident that indoor crowding um, is is something we should continue to avoid when when we can. Yeah. Um, I want to move on though uh, to, to to more unknowns, uh, and and this this is now going to be about vaccination. Um, this is of course uh, on everyone's mind, um, Dr. Maldonado. I know you have been uh, at the forefront of this amongst your many efforts. Can you give us some sense uh, for the current landscape? Uh, are we are we going too fast? Uh, no, I don't think we're going too fast. I think we we should be following. I think so far the companies are being are doing what they should be doing, but I think it's because of public pressure. Um, so I don't know that if we hadn't all been standing up and saying, writing letters and putting things in the media and in our national societies that they would be behaving this way. Because there is pressure on the companies, there's pressure on some of our federal agencies to uh, cut corners, I think. I would, I'm gonna say cut corners, I don't even yeah. think, yeah. And I do think it is critical to move very quickly. I also think you have to move quickly, but safely and have a priority, a priori parameters for what needs to be done. And I just sent a link to Dr. Pizzo. Um, uh, I wrote a letter on behalf of the Academy with David Kimberlin and Sean O'Leary um, from the Red Book Committee for the president of the AAP to send to Hank, uh, the HHS and to OWO, Operation Warp Speed and others around what we think a priori before anything happens, here's what we think would be the right way to approach vaccine approval so that we don't come back later as a, in a defensive position yeah. and make it clear where we as an academy of 65,000 plus pediatricians 
feel about what's going to happen. So we think the process is going well. And I should also mention that Grace Lee from our department is the, the chair of the safety working group for this ACIP. So this is constantly on her mind. Um, and we've discussed it um, at length. And I think things are going well if the normal processes are followed. Well, and, and to um, add to that, uh, Grace Lee will be uh, amongst three panelists uh, that we will be having specifically on um, the question, the whole hour on, on immunization next week. But maybe Dr. Prober, I'll, I'll, I'd like to hear you talk about the, the kind of undercurrent of um, under vaccination that, that was already happening in this country, which was driven in part by uh, distrust. Uh, and I think that um, it's not unreasonable to, to suggest that, that um, faith in science uh, has eroded even further. So how, how do you see this all unfolding in a culture that is, has become more uh, mistrustful of us in general? It's such an important question, um, Ellen, and, and of course you're correct that the concept of vaccine hesitancy is not a new concept. Um, and we know, well, and in fact, as, as you probably recall, even in your brief career, Ellen and, and Roshni, we used to talk about anti-vax people. Well, that was, that was a mistake, I think, that terminology. We're learning more um, about how to approach individuals who at the beginning of a conversation may have a different point of view, in this case around vaccines. And it is not good to insult them. It's not generally good in any conversation to insult the person before you start the conversation by using a pejorative term like you are vaccine, uh, you are, you're an anti-vax person, but rather terms like vaccine hesitancy in order to reach out and try to understand why that particular person, that parent, fears vaccines on behalf of their children. You are absolutely correct also, Alan, in indicating that it is lack of trust, which is often born of disinformation or the framing of information in a way which is obviously put in a negative way. And vaccine hesitancy is a major issue that we face in virtually every country in the world. There are obviously laws and regulations in the United States that have helped increase the number of successful vaccine programs across the different states. I should quickly add, because Phil went back to 1918 in his early days, I'll take it back a few years earlier, uh, 1905, when smallpox vaccine had a rough time in terms of being distributed in the United States. It went all the way to the Supreme Court in the Jacobson versus Massachusetts uh, um, argument in the Supreme Court that ultimately led to states being given the right to be able to mandate vaccine regulations. That was very important, but I only I mention it because this is not a new phenomena. Um, and you're correct that it's a growing phenomena. With COVID, if it is not handled the way Bonnie described it being appropriately handled with the regulations and processes which we have built and have in place from vaccine companies being overseen by data safety and management boards that look at the data rigorously to determine that everything is correct and to put in the right stop rules about efficacy or safety. And we know that one of the vaccines was recently halted transiently. Um, it's still halted in the United States. If it weren't for them, if it weren't for the different committees that serve the FDA in terms of the regulations, Paul Offit, one of our former fellows was on CNN this morning talking about his role as a member of the FDA committee on vaccination. And then after the FDA, when it gives approval, hopefully unencumbered by political pressure, being on the ACIP, it's one of the groups that ultimately decides what the correct use of the vaccine is. So there's a lot of intelligent vested people from data safety management boards through FDA regulations and committees through, through the ACIP and the Committee on Infectious Diseases that will hopefully get it right. We need the public to understand that so that trust isn't eroded for COVID in general or specifically and for all of the other vaccines. In the middle of the COVID epidemic, which we are, pandemic, which we are, other vaccines have all gone down across the world. It's a huge issue. And the education uh, of the, our citizens across the world needs to be increased around all vaccines, yeah. including COVID when it arrives. 
um, Dr. Pizzo, and I want to be able to have some time to move on to schools, but do you, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, what, what we may know about ongoing trials in terms of inclusion of children, um, and then maybe some speculation, and Bonnie, you can chime in too, but some speculation about uh, when vaccines are implemented, um, how, how children will be prioritized. Or yeah, not. It's, a very, it's an important question, and I, and I begin by generalizing it a little bit, which is to say that the approach to children and enrollment in either vaccine trials or in therapeutic trials has been challenged for as long as I've been um, uh, a physician and physician scientist. So many of the same dilemmas about when kids will enter clinical trials um, that we're witnessing right now um, with COVID uh, applied to things that we've seen in the past. Right now, the studies that are going on, and Bonnie, um, to her credit, along with her colleagues uh, at the AAP in their statement, have articulated the importance of enrolling children in the vaccine trials, but they're not enrolled right now. Um, so these studies are going on, and when they are completed, we won't know whether the vaccine can be extended to, to children or when that will be extended to children. Now, of course, you know, we do have the good news that children are not as adversely affected, but that same mindset also applies to many of the other therapies that are likely going to um, come along. Um, you know, this was a struggle um, that we faced, and I remember it exquisitely well when back in the HIV days when, you know, we watched adults uh, moving forward and kids dying um, from the infection, and it was very hard um, to uh, break down the barriers and get access. I think one of the things that's really important, and I want to just follow a comment that Charles made. He used the word, you know, really trying to protect the public trust. Um, and I think one of the dilemmas that we're facing today is that that's being eroded. Um, politics and science are not new. Um, we've been dealing with this for as long as the two have been together. But we've never witnessed, I don't think, the degree of erosion of scientific leaders as we're seeing today. You know, having been a public health service officer for almost 25 years, Bonnie was uh, at the CDC. We, we trust the CDC and its leaders as being the very best in the world. And yet we're witnessing the pressures that they're getting today, which are unprecedented in controlling the, uh, the emergence of what we uh, would like to see as fact-based, evidence-based approaches. We're seeing the same thing with the FDA. I spent lots of years um, uh, trying to bring new drugs to the FDA, and I know the consequences of what, what happens when you try to do that. But when the FDA director, you know, presents a uh, approval for something for which there is not data yet available, this actually is very, very worrisome uh, because we need to trust our leaders, and we can't um, go forward in this complex time um, when the veracity of science is constantly being challenged. Well, I, I just can't express enough appreciation to, to your advocacy efforts, uh, Bonnie, to your advocacy efforts on, on behalf of kids right now. It, it, it just couldn't be more important. So, so thank you for that. And speaking of advocating for children, uh, let's spend just a couple of minutes about school. Um, <laughs> School, uh, very controversial, of course. Uh, everyone is worried. Um, we've all, who uh, many of us who have school children have, have uh, listened to uh, recent calls with, with school boards and principals and they're all trying to figure out how it's gonna look. But maybe Dr. Maldonado, you're, you're doing um, a study uh, with, with a school district um, and you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Can you talk about maybe what we know about school reopening thus far? Yeah, so I'm doing, I'm involved in two studies. Well, one study, one, uh, I guess, a real life experiment, and then here at the university. So the school study that we're doing is a small private school here in, in the Bay Area in, in San Mateo County. And we're actually uh, engaged with them to test the, the teachers and the students on a weekly basis as they come back. Uh, to see whether we can uh, track transmissions within the school. And of course they're doing, it's a small school, so they can do distancing and hybrid learning and all of that. So they've got all the bells and whistles. And the idea will be to see how that works. And we're in the middle of that now. Uh, the other area of course is the university. And we have, I work working with somebody named Kristen Stoudemire, who is an amazing trauma surgeon, but also took a, a year off to do a, um, 
sabbatical around surge planning. It was mostly about surge planning for mass casualties, but this actually can be considered similar. And so she and I have been working together on modeling an epi uh, of how to bring people back to campus. Um, and so we put that model together for the university to use. So uh, we're, we have that in place. We haven't really needed it because if you look at, I mean, thankfully, knock on wood, because if you look at the dashboard that the university has on health alerts at stanford.edu, you can see we've only had two positive students so far of the graduate students on campus and they're all being, they must, they mandatorily must be, are, are tested once a week. 4,000 I think was the number that I saw. So two yeah. out of 4,000, which is- Yeah, great. so so that's great. And those are graduate students. We'll see what happens when the undergrads come back uh, in the winter, if that happens, hopefully. But the other big experiment is the, uh, we were approached by the superintendent of the Los Angeles Unified School District mm. uh, about a month ago now. And he asked us if we, if Kristen and I and, uh, and Lloyd, the Dean Minor, would be interested in helping consult with them about how to do testing for their uh, almost three quarters of a million students and over 30,000 teachers. And I think we just had to, take a deep breath and say we would get back to them. But then we talked about it and we thought, well, we can do very focused pieces of that. Obviously they have a big operation and they have a, ma an, a, a massive throughput platform. So there's a company named Summer Bio that we didn't know about who just incorporated in June as a startup, but has very experienced people from other big name companies who came in, built all the robotics to really get high throughput. So we have just started that process. As you can imagine, they're having some just operational, just trying to get that volume of testing done. They can do about 200,000 tests a week, yeah. which still is probably not enough, frankly. Um, and we can talk about, you know, what kinds of tests you would do in the real world. They're doing the, you know, the, the, gold, the Cadillac uh, PCR. Um, I don't think that you really need that, but that's what they were offered. And, um, so they're trying to roll that out now and, and hopefully when school starts in the fall, or later in the fall, we'll see what happens. So we can learn from around the world. Other experiences around the world have taught us that it does work in some cases and in others it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but again, what Dr. Pizzo said earlier is when you follow some basic principles, uh, those seem to work well. That is, if you look at what hasn't worked, Mm. Uh, a lot, being lax about masking and, and not distancing, et cetera, or putting up shields if you can't distance, putting up, say, uh, 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 clear shields, um, you're going to see, you may see transmissions depending on the degree of prevalence in your population. So we will be learning more, but I really still think that in the end, um, the PPE and the distancing are going to really uh, make a, a real difference in keeping uh, people safe at school. And, and Lisa Chamberlain uh, will be uh, leading uh, a, another hour uh, specifically on schools in two weeks. So, so please sure. for that. I, I, I apologize that we can't get a little more granular uh, about this now, but I do. I'm seeing a whole lot of questions popping up. And so, Rajni, um, do you want to uh, take it from here and, and go through a, a few of the audience questions? Sure, um, and what I think piggybacking to what uh, Bonnie was just saying, I think at least two questions have come up about have there been specific uh, lessons that we have learned from successful school reopening areas like in Florida or in colleges that have opened and have not had a spike in their population? Yeah, so there, I, you know, it's hard to know exactly what uh, what because it, it, it's. I think what uh, Alan brought up really about the dispersion factor is really critical. So, how do you, you know, again, this is a big gap. We don't really know how to define who's the what's the phenotype of a super spreader or a super spreading event. We know what the phenotype of an event is, but there's so many potential of the of those, and yet we haven't seen that degree of spreading. I will say that in general, uh, really keeping to the distancing, uh, and the usual things, you know, masking, distancing, but testing is helpful as well. And to a certain extent, uh, you know, there are a number of models now, particularly uh, from uh, uh, one group at, at, the, at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, or very early on showing that, which is 
intuitive. If you do lots of not great tests, it's way better than doing few really good tests. So we should be really focusing on getting inexpensive rapid tests out to as many people as possible. Um, and there's some logistical challenges around that, but really, you know, you think about it, I mean, how do we get pregnancy tests out? So if you could do a pregnancy type test, those could, they, they're not going to be very good. You're, but you're only, you're going to miss, uh, you're not going to miss probably the most infectious people in those, in those tests. So if you could do, I mean, the way I envision it is having like a little strip of tests that you can do and just take one every day and you know, probably fr from your nose, because it, it doesn't seem that oral tests work as well. But just, you know, testing yourself every day, even if you, you know, you miss some of the positives, you're going to pick up way more in potential infections than you're going to yeah. miss. Yeah. You know, I, I would just add one thing. I think um, uh, you framed it, Bonnie, Will, and Rajni, your question does. I think that we need lots of case study evaluations going on. I, I have to say I'm grateful for Bonnie for the small school that she's doing at Santa Clara. I have two grandchildren who go to that school and uh, when I read the policies I was very pleased to see her involved. But you know there's a lot of variation that's going on around the country. So I was um, at a meeting yesterday with people from Notre Dame and you know if you remember they opened in August and they had to close and now they're struggling to kind of reopen. I was on a Board of Trustees um, call this morning at the University of Rochester, which is a much more insulated area, and they're opening, you know, and they're they're using all the same principles that Bonnie articulated, but they're functioning okay. And yet we've witnessed many other colleges that have had real, real big problems, um, and a lot of it has to do with social behavior um, as well. So I'm hoping that every one of these experiments that we've gone will be able to, you know, make sure we're recording the data because this is not going to be our, sadly, our last pandemic and we're going to need to be prepared for the next ones going forward as well. Well, I think picking up on that point, it's, and back to your point about dispersion, Alan, it's sort of uh, the dispersion issue on steroids because instead of trying to identify the single person as a super spread or whatever, uh, pardon the word, you're looking then at environments that have tens to hundreds to thousands of young individuals, K through 12 and through college. So every lesson is going to be a, a unique lesson. And there's no federal effort to try to pull all the information together. Schools have not risen to a priority of trying to aggregate those data. Um, there are, the New York Times has a, has a program that they're trying to actually aggregate that data. And for those that are interested, every Wednesday, they provide a summary of sort of the, the school status as they can measure it across the country from various different uh, reporting sources. So that may be valuable. And then there are individual stories that come out. There was a story about Cajun Valley uh, uh, schools near San Diego, an inner city population of young people and how they prepared for those children to go back to schools, 27 schools and a success story that they told. So the anecdotes have value, but obviously as Phil said, the aggregated data and ultimately the analysis of that is what's gonna teach yeah. the big lessons. Yeah. Well, I, we, have, we have about, maybe we have time for a, a rapid fire question, uh, Rajni, any, um, any ones that can be answered quickly, you think? Um, well, there are several questions and hopefully we will address this one uh, in our future sessions. For example, there is a question on masking. Um, so maybe Bonnie, you can quickly answer this one about masking of very young children and what are your thoughts on that and whether masking can help um, with reducing spread with activities like, like shouting and singing, if there's any information on that. Yeah, so um, I, we just, re AAP just released our guidance on PPE today, so we re just updated it. So um, just look on your AAP daily briefs and there's a link to the new PPE guidelines, but um, the AAP has been pretty uh, consistently supportive of masking kids over two. Obviously, for kids under two, it gets to be tricky. I mean, even for kids over two, uh, mm -hmm. we, we feel that there hasn't, as with everything else, there hasn't been enough done to provide masks for kids under six. As we know from the hospital, under six, it's very hard to get anything that fits kids well. And so I think um, really focusing on that. But um uh, there aren't any data really in children looking at that. Oh, no, there is. The daycare center study that I told you about, the one in Utah. So there were three outbreaks in Utah. 
and all three of them were, were actually, the, there was a staff member who came in who was yeah. infected. But the interesting thing is that in, in the biggest outbreak, the staff member uh, had no contact, uh, no infected contact, but the, that was a, a bigger daycare center, a big outbreak. But uh, they weren't using any masks at all in that particular daycare center. So I do think that, uh, and, and I mentioned about the eight month old. So if you can't wear, obviously an eight month old shouldn't wear a mask, but if you are in a daycare situation with your baby, you know, you would have to, I would be very careful about making sure that you're, uh, you know, you practicing proper hygiene, even around your infant. I think you just have to be you know, more cognizant. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be in physical contact with your children, but there are ways to do that to avoid touching their faces or having touching your faces. Well, great. Listen, thank you again to you guys. I want to close, um, as promised, uh, by asking you each to reflect on some comment, recent comments from Tony Fauci. He was giving grand rounds to the uh, Harvard hospitals in Boston and was asked about his top three lessons learned from the pandemic. And, and what I really appreciate is what he began, you guys have alluded to this already, but he, he began by underscoring the importance of humility and, and really stating that that was going to transcend all three uh, of the lessons that, that he was, would provide, which are uh, never underestimate the potential of a pandemic. Number two, we must do scientifically sound research during the outbreak. Don't just throw therapies at people blindly. And three, you don't know everything. You must adapt to new information. So um, we'll have you go around. Maybe Charles, you can start. Um, we have two minutes, but can you reflect on those and, and would you add anything? I would not add anything. Uh, Dr. Fauci, as Phil knows better than I, is a wise person with always sound guidance. Uh, he's in a very difficult situation, obviously, but the wisdom of those three points uh, are indisputable in my mind. Uh, Phil? Sure, thanks. So I, I have to say I've known Tony Fauci for 45 years and we worked very closely together over the years and he's just, to me, he's iconic uh, in what he's been able to do and we need to support him as much as possible. I would just add one other thing and that is, um, and this was always a kind of little interesting um, dipole between Tony and I and that he always focused, still does, on adults. I think our job is to focus on children and make sure that therapies are being tested in kids, that vaccines are being tested. This is a, it's, it's a lesson that we've learned in the past that is still relevant to today, and we clearly need to change in the future. Wonderful. All right, Bonnie. So uh, I agree. I think that Tony Fauci is uh, an icon, and I hold Dr. Pizzo up there with him because he also represented us in the federal workforce for so many years, um, and obviously with Charles here in the academic sphere. Um, but I would add one thing. I think what he said is absolutely correct, but um, I think we need to be inclusive about the people that are sitting at the table when we're making all of those decisions. Mm -hmm. We have to remember the other pandemic that we're facing today, and it's not a pandemic that just started a year ago. And so bringing people to the table Teamwork. I mean, for me, the teamwork has really been what I think has just been the most inspiring thing about having to get through these times is working mm -hmm. with other people, getting to know people from different worlds that we probably never would have worked with yeah. and uh, working towards a common uh, goal. So, yeah. and I know he does that, but I think, um, you know, it, it is something that will underlie everything that we do. Yeah, if I could just add one quick comment to Bonnie's, which is I think this is also revealed all the fracture lines in our healthcare system, where it doesn't work and what we need to do to change that. It's underscored the fracture lines in our public health system and what we need to do to deal with that going forward. And quite candidly, it's revealed what happens when we don't have effective leadership defending science and truth in order to bring the cohesion together of our various communities. Amen to all of you. Uh, really very appreciative uh, of all the wise input today. Thank you so much. And, and we will uh, try to address many of the uh, questions that we weren't able to answer in subsequent sessions. So please join us for those. Thank and you. Everyone. Thanks to both of you for organizing this. Thank and you. Allison for your support as well. It's been great. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University.
please visit us at med.stanford.edu.